Hey guys, welcome back to the fifth biology video. Today's topic is on ecosystems. We're looking at classifying, measuring and managing, and this is part one of a two-part series. So the learning goals, we're going to look at what ecosystems are composed of, various habitats, how to gather and interpret data to be able to manage ecosystems, as well as the different processes which we go about to collect data. Those learning goals will spill over into next week as well. So firstly, classifying ecosystems. Let's backtrack for a moment and talk about some terms from last week. We spoke about the total number of one species in an area is called a population. But when there are various species together in one area, this is called a community. When we think about how a community of organisms interacts with the environment, we're talking about an ecosystem now. The way that ecosystems can be defined is quite fluid and it depends on how much we either zoom in or zoom out. And there's various models that provide us with a framework to be able to classify ecosystems. One from the textbook is the Holdridge Life Zone System, and it looks at climate, looks at weather, precipitation, soil levels to give us an indication of the area that we're looking at. The one, however, that we spend more time on is Speck's Structural Classification of Australian Vegetation. And this looks at the tallest tree in an area, we then calculate the percentage of the foliage cover that that tallest tree provides just by vertical sightings, observations. That will give us a column. And then we think about the dominant vegetation species or structure, and that will give us the row. So this is one way in which we can classify ecosystems. So if we were to split ecosystems up, we can classify them into either terrestrial, land-based, or aquatic, water-based. And how we further split up aquatic ecosystems, again, varies, it's fluid. And we could do the initial categorization into either saltwater or freshwater. So let's do that today. We're going to look at saltwater ecosystems, namely the ocean. The ocean can be classified in different ways as well. We could look at this image here, which shows us the different levels, layers of the ocean based on sunlight penetration. So it's sunlight zone, twilight zone, down to the, the hadal zone or trenches. We're going to focus more on this type of uh, organization which looks at layers based more so on depth. I'll point out a couple of features on this image taken from your textbook. Uh, we can look at the horizontal plane and see there is the neuritic range, and that's looking at the layer of water above the continental shelf area. When that shelf drops off, we're then talking about the oceanic zone. So, the layers as we go down, we can begin with the littoral zone, and that's from 0 to 200 meters. Then we have the bathyal, the abyssal, and the hadal. We can also look at different ecosystems that are present here. So this term here, the plankton and nectar ecosystem, refers to the surface, the ecosystem where organism and species live and interact with their environment when we're looking at the surface here. So plankton refers to the microscopic little producers of the ocean. Microscopic, uh, and they're the producers being photosynthetic, so they need access to sunlight, so they are in this layer here, the littoral zone. Our nectar refers to free-swimming organisms, so that can be turtles, fish, uh, seals, and when we're talking about those organisms, we're talking about this ecosystem where they live. The benthic ecosystem refers to the lower layers where we're looking at the sediment. 
So scientists think that we only know about 5% or have discovered 5% of our oceans. However, this team of people, Dr. Tim O'Hara, has recently been out trying to change that. And this ship is called the Investigator. And we talked about this in class where they spent uh, quite a, a time at sea where they uh, lowered a metal box and dragged it along the ocean floor, uh, gathering up various species. This was one of them, the coffin fish, which was found at a thousand meters depth. They also found a faceless fish, which hadn't been seen since 1873 off the waters of Papua New Guinea. And they are faceless, not because they don't have eyes or mouth, but because their features are adapted to their, their deep level environment. The eyes are actually buried uh, deep under the skin and the mouth is on the underside of the body because it sucks up little crustaceans off the, the sea bed floor. And then we have a deep sea lizard fish here. These species, uh, we're finding that there are so many more species out there than what we know. And if you would like to learn more about the roles of marine biologists, I've included a link in the description where you can hear about um, a particular marine biologist's journey to getting to a point of doing what she does. So, that was saltwater ecosystems. Let's talk about freshwater ecosystems now. There's positive and effect, uh, positive and negative effects to living in a freshwater ecosystem. One positive being that nutrients are readily available, whether that's due to minerals washing off the land into the water or shallow areas, so animals break down and decay more easily. There's more uh, minerals and nutrients available. Uh, there's also not the problem of high water pressure, but we still have the positive effect of buoyancy. Organisms can move around freely and easily in water. However, there are negative effects as well with shallow freshwater ecosystems, variations in depth, salt, temperature, and oxygen levels are more likely than in deeper saltwater ecosystems. Uh, and water tend to be turbid or cloudy, thus reducing light penetration. Deep water is also low in oxygen. Uh, these tables are taken from the textbook, so I'll talk through them quite briefly. Um, also, different types of freshwater ecosystems are more suitable to various organisms based on the characteristics of the ecosystem. So rapid streams, as you can imagine, are there's a lot of moving water, and so therefore any sediment or loose material is washed away. The, the surface or floor of a rapid stream is therefore quite hard. Um, and there's crevices for protection for small organisms, um, and it's often shallow with good light and high oxygen due to the, the waves and the, the moving water. Uh, we have various insects in these uh, areas as well. When we're talking about pools, these are the areas between the running water. Um, and they're usually soft mud or sand bottoms. And we have insects that love these areas. Sometimes fish, snakes, turtles, and frogs as well. In ponds, these are isolated, smaller bodies of water. Uh, there's slow movement, and that's either only due to wind or convection, so heating. And they have soft, muddy bottoms. Again, we see insects. Okay, uh, ponds, and then we have lakes. And these are large bodies of water. And here's a picture of Lake Helia in Western Australia, pink due to its high salt level concentrations. So that's the aquatic system. Now looking at terrestrial ecosystems being land-based. So the way in which we uh, can classify terrestrial ecosystems, again, varies. We have the biome method, and a biome is just a large area with a similar climate. So these uh, different colors and shades here represent different biomes. You can have 
biomes within biomes as well. Within a biome, there is also different layers again. Uh, here we're looking at the vertical stratification of a forest. A strata is a layer, and here we're talking about vertical layers. The emergent, the canopy, the understory, and the forest floor, as seen in this image. So that's one way in which we can classify terrestrial ecosystems. Another way is by ecozones and ecoregions. So an ecozone is a large area in which organisms have been um, in relative isolation in the way that they've been evolving. So Australia is quite isolated being an island as well as the other large areas we see here. If we were to zoom in on an ecozone, we would have ecoregions. So we've looked at vertical stratification. There is also uh, latitudinal or horizontal stratification as well. I have a question for you. If we are to think about latitudinally on this image of the earth, say the biosphere, where is the greatest amount of biodiversity? Is it along the equator, further away? It's actually not at the equator. There's little movement of weather there. It is more so as you move away, just offset of the equator where the rainforest regions are. There's a lot more movement of weather and rainfall. However, it drops off again as you get to the poles. So biodiversity in ecosystems. Biodiversity of an ecosystem is a measure of the number of different types and abundance of populations in a community. Here we have an image of um, a forest that has been cleared due to deforestation. Where there was once high biodiversity, there can now be low biodiversity. The reason why this occurs is generally for farming and agricultural purposes. And when land is cleared, it's generally to make way for one type of crop, whether that's to grow wheat or to grow a potato. When one type of crop is being grown, it's called a monoculture. Obviously, biodiversity is largely decreased due to human impact and farming. Here is an image taken from NASA's website, and it represents the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. Now, it backtracks hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and it shows a large increase in the last 50 years. The way in which scientists gather this data is by looking at bubbles in ice. Now, all scientists look at the same data, but the way they interpret it is what varies. However, what scientists can largely agree on is that, yes, the temperatures in the Earth are increasing, and a lot of it is due to the um, chemicals in the atmosphere. However, what the uh, argument is about is whether it's human impact or not. And I think looking at the images and knowing that trees are the lungs of the planet are there's strong correlations that can be made but there's also a good argument either way so talking about biodiversity in ecosystems we can have two main measures to give us an idea of biodiversity species richness is a measure of the numbers of species present and the evenness of species in relation to one another. Whereas species diversity is a measure of the number of species found in a community compared with the number of individuals. We're gonna look at these two things a little bit more now uh, by calculating Simpson's diversity index. So we've done a little bit of this in class. Here is a table representing uh, three quadrats uh, and the mean, standard deviation, standard error. But the question is, to calculate the species diversity in quadrat two, 
using the Simpsons Diversity Index, leaving your answer in two decimal place. So quadrat two, that's what we're looking at here. A n, a number, is are these numbers here, 23, 1, 12, and 2. The first thing we're going to do using our Simpsons Diversity Index is to find, now that we've got n, what does n take one? So this is how I'd like you to do your working out uh, when practicing and in exam conditions. So create another column. Well, n, take 1, 22, 0, 11, and 1. Now we have this section of the formula here. The next step is to times n by n take 1. So 23 times 22. There's our answer. We're working out this top row here. Do the same for each number and you'll get these values. The next step is to get the sum of what we just figured out here. This symbol means sum. So when we add these up, we will get 640. Now, let's go down. We're looking at the bottom row here. So the N is the total number of organisms of all species. These are all the species. Quadro 2, the total number is 38. Now we're going to do n times y and take 1. So n take 1 is 37. Therefore, 38 times 37 equals 1,406. Moving on, just to make more space, let's put these values together now using our formula here. So we figured out that the top row here the 640 and the bottom row here is 1,406. To figure out our SDI, we'll do one take what we just came up with, 640 divided by 1,406. And that would give us the answer 0 0.455 for this region. And if we subtract that from one, our answer is 0. 545 and the question asked us to round it to two decimal places so there is our measure 0 0.55 we also are going to talk for a minute on species richness another indication of the amount or level of biodiversity in an ecosystem so species richness as we said before is the measure of the number of species present and the evenness of species in relation to one another. This is our formula where capital S equals what we're trying to find, species richness. Uh, lowercase s is the total number of different species in a sample. And n equals the total number of all individuals or organisms in the sample. The reason why we take samples is because Ecosystems can be very large spaces. And so if we randomly select one area of that, we can get an indication of the entire area. So here is an example from the textbook. And it says, calculate the species richness for community in table one, each community. The same six species are represented in each community. So. We're trying to find capital S here, species richness. Um, lowercase s, what's that again? It's the total number of different species. And this actually is um, is given to us here. Uh, so lowercase s, total number of different species. There are one, two, three, four, five, six different types of species. So that's our lowercase s. And our total number of individual species is 100. So it's... Uh, what we just had, 6 divided by square root of 100 would give us 0 0.6. Species richness does not, however, reflect how evenly 
the species are represented. You could have one species a lot more abundant than another. It doesn't reflect that. It just gives us a reflection on the number of species present. So a couple of questions now to finish off. Uh, this is again taken from the mock exam uh, and the question is a dominant vegetation community classification system would classify this ecosystem as A, B, C or D. We haven't spoken uh, specifically about this, however, you can put the information together to come up with an answer. Um, this is just about inferring information. I won't read through each question, you can pause the video here. Uh, we will go through these in class. So take uh, the time to do this, please. Question number two, we're looking at our species richness using the formula that we just learned. And there are two questions here, A and B. This is the image that the question is referring to. These are the strata levels. Again, we're looking at species richness. This time inferring data of a graph here. Determine the estimated species richness for this study site. A written response question. And that's it. So today I'm going to leave you with a quote from this man. It says, biodiversity is the greatest treasure we have. Its diminishment is to be prevented at all costs. I hope you've enjoyed this video guys and I'll see you in class. All the best.